In previous months we heard about the Leading Edge Initiative and I just wanted to give some updated information and data, I think which uh, tells a good story about how the uh, resources are being utilized. Uh, currently we have up to 665 contacts by students and teachers. Uh, what's interesting now is that primarily before we were talking about how much teachers were starting to use the yoga studio to help build their practice and ask good questions on professional learning. Uh, we're now up to 105 students who have visited the yoga studio for different reasons. Um, that's about a quarter of our population of new freshmen who are part of this uh, initiative. I think that's also promising. I think what's also exciting, um, the vast majority of all of these visits are not break-fix issues. These are issues about how can I do something differently? How can I innovate? Um, how can I do a different type of a presentation? How can I find different types of resources to help support my learning? So I think that's really good. Moving down, um, also it's nice to see too that uh, those uh, ed techs are getting out into classrooms as well. And so we actually have 63 classroom visits where they're actually in classrooms and helping the teachers advance their practices. Uh, we've got an important update about the PARC assessment. Uh, we've talked about PARC, we did a lot in, during the assessment report um, with uh, Assistant Superintendent Fagel. And so I just wanted to give you an update. Um, this past week we received an email from State Superintendent Christopher Koch. Um, and now he's permitted the districts to choose between the following grades for assessing. And basically it's the freshman, sophomore, and the junior years. If you remember before, it was only going to be a junior level test. I think a number of districts asked for a reprieve, particularly for their junior level students who would be facing kind of a battery of tests, starting with uh, AP, then doing park exams, um, I'm sorry, ACT, then doing park exams, then going to the whole AP. Um, back to more park exams and then back to final exams. And so they've allowed us some different options. And right now, uh, we're still working through all of those options, but we look like we're going to be offering it to the freshman class. Uh, we see it as an advantage because it does establish baseline data for our freshman students. Uh, we're also uh, encouraged because it is an online test, and since we now have a leading edge initiative, it's an opportunity for us to pilot doing online testing at Lake Forest High School in a year and so uh, you know, we hate to say that this is you know a trial year but it is it is in some ways a pilot year so if we have to take them all again if there are issues this is probably the best time to do it and so we feel like we're in a good position to administer those tests and uh, while it is not a test where we have established history of data I think again it does set the baseline for the data and I think families will benefit because we, they will get this initial data back on their students. We're also planning on helping to make decisions about our students in terms of placement and so on so on and so on going forward. Um, one of the uh, I think difficult parts for people to accept about the park uh, assessments is the actual length and the number of tests. I think uh, all the experts are, are in agreement that it's a good test. We heard from Steve Cordigan um, previous meetings about what a good test is because it is aligned to the standards that we want to teach but the length of time. So it is consist it does consist of nine separate exams. Um, there are five exams that we're going to be giving um, in March um, and there will be four that will be given in May. And those tests range from anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes plus 30 minutes of administration time. What we're planning on doing um, is again finalizing our schedule, but we're trying to have a schedule that is least disruptive, that doesn't affect all of the other classes, and doesn't effectively shut down the school day for nine days. And so right now, the best model that we've been looking at and looking at what some of our, our, our peer institutions is one that would involve a series of late starts. And so on those late starts, we would still have the same classes. We would administer those tests um, the first period of the day, if you will. Um, we would also administer some of those tests at the back end of the AP test. So while the juniors are taking the AP exams in that final week, our freshmen will be taking those tests. Um, so that's it. Again, there's a lot going on with PARC. Uh, we're you know, looking forward to hearing more. We're going to have a new governor in January. But I think it's important to know that a state assessment is required for Lake Forest High School. And right now, this is a state assessment. So for those critics who say, well, why don't we do something else differently? It is a state required assessment. So tomorrow we have a special benefit basketball game. And so what we're doing is uh, benefiting the Johnson family. And we're calling for Hope for Lexi. Uh, one of our uh, beloved teachers, Steve Johnson, uh, has a daughter who is suffering from cancer and who is under the care of a doctor. Uh, we are happy to say that uh, the preliminary 
uh, treatment that she's getting seems to be positive. And so we're having a benefit tomorrow. We have a, a girls basketball game starting at 5.30 against Mundelein, followed by a boys game at Lake Zurich. We've been selling t-shirts throughout the school. Um, I know that uh, the Johnson family appreciates the support. I think that there's uh, a, a really good example. And it's just another example of uh, how we can pull together for one another. It's also holiday season. And so there's a lot of great things happening at the school right now. Uh, one of the, my favorite things for my first year was the LFHS Holiday Concert and Spaghetti Dinner. So it's a wonderful dinner we're going to have this Sunday. The orchestra will begin at 3 in the afternoon, uh, followed by spaghetti dinner from 4.45 to 6.45, and then a choral performance at 7.45. This year was our inaugural year for our robotics team, and they're off. We've actually got two teams, and they're doing a great job. Um, December 18th, if you come to the school, um, and it's after school, I believe we're going to start about 4 o'clock. Uh, we're going to host our very first uh, robotics competition. So we'll have our robotics team and other robotics teams from uh, the northern Chicagoland area competing. Uh, so it's all pretty exciting. We've had curriculum meetings with our parents, and they've been very positive, letting them know of our curriculum offerings. Uh, we are going to have our official curriculum night held on February 26th. And so at that point, we'll be introducing any new courses that we'll be talking about for the following year and new initiatives. Um, we also have um, the Human Rights Day, which is tomorrow, and we have a special presentation by Mary Eileen Curie, and we have a Jam for Justice concert uh, with our students during lunch. So lots of positive things. Uh, unfortunately, Luke and Lena are unable to make it today, so, uh, but uh, they, they send their regards. Thank you. Did you say that the robotics meet was on the 18th after school, is that correct? That is correct. Thank you, Mr. Rogers, and I have a couple of additional things to, to add to the, to the report. Very importantly, uh, beginning in, on January 20th, we will be administering the National School Climate Center, the NSCC, survey to all staff, families, uh, and families, uh, K-12, and also to students in grades 3 through 12. This is a survey that the high school has administered two other times, first in 2007, then again in 2011, and as part of our strategic plan, one of the things that was very, very important coming out of the mission, vision, and goals, and also uh, embedded in that in the strategic plan is social emotional wellness of our students and the reflection of that and how we intended to measure all of those things. Well, as you may recall, we spent a good deal of time exploring and being very interested in Gallup polling. Unfortunately, our uh, our experience with Gallup was such that uh, despite many attractive features of, that, of the poll they offer uh, for students and for staff, uh, the administration of that poll uh, was, was not amenable to our needs. Uh, and more specifically, there's a single sign-on for an entire building, meaning that you couldn't guarantee that uh, one user took the survey only one time. So uh, uh, with all of our surveys, for whatever reason, uh, Gallup does not offer the ability that we have even with our homegrown surveys to say, okay, each uh, uh, unique user can do not more than one or not more than two surveys with a Gallup poll. It's unlimited at all times. So the credibility, the reliability of your data is going to be always in question with that. And so we began to explore other things. And our students at Cryo last uh, or two months ago were really helpful in helping us think about this, uh, which survey best suits our, our needs. So importantly, from the NSCC, you get a survey that works for students and it also works for staff. And all, there's also a parental component to it as well. So we'll get uh, our entire school community. Uh, the school climate measure is used uh, and to set in motion a school-wide and community-wide process of understanding specific strengths and needs and to further improve those efforts. Uh, the report that we get is very, very detailed. It's about a half an inch thick, in fact, with uh, action plans included in it. This is a group that this is what they do for a living. Uh, they are the National School Climate Center. So they're committed to uh, student growth and social emotional uh, wellness for the students. Uh, a couple other things that are, are worth mentioning that our administrators have been very hard at work on something that our families need. Uh, it 
it may not sound like a real razzle dazzle, but it means a lot of convenience for our families, and that is online registration for students. This has been a long time coming. It's more difficult than it might appear. Uh, we expect for the 2015 school year uh, to have that in place. For a parent, what this means is that when you enroll, if you have three children to enroll in a school system, uh, your data carries from one student to the next. You don't have to fill out the same forms over and over and over again. And you can do it from the convenience of your home or whatever computer you happen to have. Uh, we're also going to be connecting this uh, between our elementary and our high school district uh, so it is more seamless. Uh, finally, uh, a word about what is happening uh, statewide that has an impact on, on, our, on our school system. On uh, November 21st of this year, Judge John Belts of the Sangamon County Circuit Court ruled that the Illinois Pension Reform Bill, known as Senate Bill 1, was un unconstitutional. This had been forecast for some time. It's a, a, something of a telegraph punch, if you will. Uh, it, would, it is expected to go to the Supreme Court for a ruling uh, at a date yet to be determined. Uh, the inside uh, the Beltway conversation, if there is a Beltway around Springfield or inside the court, uh, soybean field uh, conversation, is that uh, the ruling will come quickly. Uh, we hope to have a resolution to that as quickly as possible. Of course, whatever uh, the ruling might be, it will set off some other thing that we can't necessarily anticipate at this point. But uh, it does look like uh, the, the Senate Bill 1 uh, it's very likely that Senate Bill 1 will be declared unconstitutional at the Supreme Court level as well. And that concludes this for Superintendent's report, Mr. Black. Thank you very much, Mr. Simic. And one comment from Mr. Rogers. Uh, I don't think you mentioned it uh, in this particular report, but uh, as fellow board members, I'm sure all of us have read uh, about some of the difficulties that districts, various districts, have expressed regarding park testing. One of which is just not having the online resources to be able to administer the test, and Mr. Rogers, in his presence, uh, provided uh, Chromebooks for all of our freshmen. So with the freshman testing uh, next year, they will all have Chromebooks. And, and so we really have a class, and I realized that you were having a curve there, so I commend you for putting us in such a good position to, you know, have the resources to be able to, you know, be able to administer this in ways that not many other districts Okay, it's uh, now time for public participation. So just, about, just, a, just a quick question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. And, and you may not have it right now, Mike, but I'd be curious uh, what actions were taken from the previous survey. So we've, we've used this survey in the past, and I, I think it'd be interesting to the other, it'd be interesting to me, so I'll speak for myself, what actions were taken from the recommendations that came out of the last couple surveys. I, I can only tell you what I can remember, which is going to be brief. Uh, so I spoke with Mr. Maher, John Maher, at the high school. He, he's really one of the people that is uh, most interested in this. It's certainly his bailiwick, uh, he's a social worker uh, by training. He's very interested in, the, uh, in, in this particular survey instrument. Uh, in my conversations with him, he said they, they utilize uh, the feedback to go and have specific conversations with, uh, with staff and with groups of students, and I'd follow, follow up with him uh, more on, on what, uh, what those entail. There's a, there's a concept out there where there's someone that knows how your business is running better than anyone else, and it's the customer, right? So if we can capture that, and so I, I, I'm very interested in the survey, but I'm interested in, in more than just the exercise of the survey, if we do have actionable information, and what we've learned from the past, I think we'll, um, help sponsor um, thoughtful participation in this next one. And we had really great feedback from our students. So, you know, those, we need to look at our students as our customers. And some of the stuff that we heard from our students was really, really helpful, even in the administration of, of the survey. And I couldn't agree more. The, the, the purpose of doing a survey is to, is to gather data that drives your future uh, actions. So I'll, I'll find out and I'll get back uh, with you and others about what we've done in the past with that. I can't tell you what we'll do next because the data will then determine that. Nikki, okay. I don't know if you want to comment as someone else who was here for those two surveys, but I'll throw out my opinions. Actually, I was going to say, I, I 
Um, I feel quite sure that we have had reports on the actionable items that have come out of them, but I can't really tell you what those were. So, so Mr. Yeah. Block, if you have some Well, I, I would just say that uh, we shared the results of the survey uh, and analysis of the survey by the administration at a board meeting. We put the results on the website. Uh, we, I remember distinctly, and I think both occasions had a great deal of difficulty in getting significant parent participation. We got very significant student and and staff participation, but uh, I remember numbers you know, sub 100, uh, like 60 or something for parent participation. So for those listening, uh, just to put you on alert, uh, the feedback is very helpful to us. It's one of the ways in which we as a board and, and Mr. Simic and his team as administrators uh, can get direct feedback on you know, parents' uh, opinion, for that matter, community's opinion. I think we opened up the community members. Right? Uh, I remember distinctly there were some comments from the student body in one or both of the past surveys regarding the climate for personal safety and security at the school, and I think we made some uh, adjustments, uh, particularly once the renovations were completed. In, uh, uh, the things we did to, to uh, you know, not only did the facilities in themselves, the modifications provide a greater sense of safety and security, but we instituted some new policies in, in response to that. I remember and that's, that's the extent of my memory, but uh, I think it's a healthy thing. You know, it's done right. You know, as, as with any other survey, uh, it's all the questions how, you know, where they're raised and that sort of thing. But, uh, but it's valuable, potentially valuable, and who can we take it seriously? And I look forward to hearing the results and the analysis of those results and any recommendations that they suggest that might work. On, on the issue of uh, participation, that's something that uh, Mrs. Local mentioned uh, as well, that we really did have a hard time getting our parents to, uh, to participate in this. And we're very optimistic, I would say, at this point. We have talked about it through the Michigan goals, and it is very much a time front burner uh, for uh, for the board, for the administration, uh, for our staff and for our parents at this point. And so our, our level of engagement is going to be very, very high on this issue and I, I look forward to reporting uh, results better than 64 on our number of parents participating. Okay, and now uh, time to the meeting to ask if there's anyone uh, here from the public who would like to uh, address the board or is there any member of the public who would like to do so? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, do we have any reports uh, for tonight? No, sir, we, uh, we do not. Okay, then we'll move on to uh, reports from our board committees. Uh, Mrs. Snowland, do you have a report for the Education Committee? No, I don't. The committee has not met since our last board meeting. Okay, uh, Mr. Powers, I have a feeling you do have a report for us from the Finance and Operations Committee. I do indeed, particularly since we have met. Uh, we met um, on Wednesday, November 12th. Um, the purpose of that session was to review our audit findings. So um, the team from Miller's Cooper came in, walked us through um, all the details associated with their audit, which is something we're obligated to perform on an annual basis um, without boring anybody on a lot of the details. Uh, the, the piece that was most impressive is the process that's, in put, that's been put in place. I think there's the appropriate checks and balances and in, in, in serving as the new chair of the committee. Um, it's always reassuring to know that you've got, you've got smart, talented, capable people managing that process for all of us. And, um, and, and certainly this year was no exception to that. Um, it's been a great transition from year to year, particularly as members of the audit team kind of roll on and off, and it's designed to do that on purpose. So it's not the same person every year that, that's delivering the findings. Um, we did very well, which is, which is certainly a testament to the, the entire finance team and the organization of the high school. Al and Jen, Brittany, fantastic job. and. Um, and we're very pleased with those results. They're available should anybody want to, to, to read the findings, we can make sure we get those to you. I don't think they're on the website, but uh, for anybody looking for bedtime reading, particularly some of my colleagues on the board, have at it. Thank you. Uh, okay, does any of the other members have anything to add to that? Go ahead. Mr. Block, I'd like 
like that one thing that we did talk about in the um, last spring we made some significant changes to our textbook process and went to a fee rather than a purchase and one of the things is we went into the summer and talked about with the auditors is we need to do a write-off on that because there are no longer assets um, now we didn't budget that going into the spring because quite frankly that wasn't on our radar screen we were focused on that change how we so we did talk about that at that meeting how we deal with that and what impact that has we really have to wait and assess as we move through the year and see how other pieces of the budget come in. But through our discussion and working with the auditors this summer, that did get on our radar screen. So uh, there'll be more to come on that later. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to liaison reports. Uh, we have any liaison reports for today? Uh, Ted, in particular, Mr. Moore? Uh, not much to report, but the MSSCB board will be meeting uh, tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Um, there's a lot going on with the MSSCB time. And if anybody would like to go down with me, uh, feel free to meet at my house at about 6.30, 6.40. Um, it, it's uh, located in Allen Park. Um, what day is that again? Tomorrow night. Tomorrow. So if you aren't going to the uh, Johnson Benefit, Basketball game. Uh, this would be a little good way to spend your evening. And, and, uh, like I said, there's a lot going on here. I think that actually at some point it would be beneficial for most board members to at least go out to see where an SSCD is, see some of the facilities, and also as we look at revising uh, how it um, operates from a financial standpoint. We all know that it operates uh, from a student standpoint. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, the board members that bring us to approval of uh, a new student 
resource officer agreement with the city of uh, Lake Forest. And is there all this Last spring and early summer, the city approached us and asked both school districts to share the cost of providing this new resource officer in this district. Um, based on my former life, that was not an unusual request or concept to me. Uh, we asked Scott Craig to check around. concept of the finance and operations meeting in August. The committee then asked us to come back with some more details about what the job entailed and the role the SRO played. At the October meeting, Principal Rogers and Dean Clegg attended that meeting and went into more detail about the interaction that the officer has uh, in school operations <coughs> with students and how that transitions past the school as well. I believe everybody left their understanding of the role that it's an important role in the concept. Um, based on the discussion there and the internal discussions that we, that we had, I met with Chief Health a couple of times and took an agreement draft that the city had put together and we tweaked that a little bit, primarily in the area of, of scheduling. Um, the one issue that we had in both times a little bit was because the officer can be pulled out for training and for different investigations, sometimes scheduling that officer for duties becomes difficult. And so there's a commitment on both sides there to, to have more communication along that line. Um, also, the requirements regarding training and some clarification regarding what overtime would kick in or things that you're able to clarify. I have to say through the process, I really enjoyed working with Chief Hell. I think we have built a very good relationship. And I'm just confident on a couple of levels going forward with this. This is a good agreement. Uh, I think as far as the cost splits go, it's very favorable to us. Um, but also, if it doesn't work, there's a 30-day outlaws on either party. Now, I think we're both committed to it because there's value to both entities. Um, so if there is something going forward that's not working, I'm confident we'll be able to work it out. But we're comfortable with the agreement presented to you tonight. Uh, thank you, Mr. Olson. Should be 
we should have some ability to you know, put them on flex time as opposed to pay I mean, you know, time and a half. You want to address some of those concerns? Sure. On the uh, uh, utilizing the higher salary, I would have shared that concern. However, with the, the cost split on the percentages, I think that worked out to our benefit and neutralize that. So we we're looking at the, the aggregate. On the overtime pay, we are running pay on the overtime. One of the conversations we had, and one of the requests we had, was exactly what you just asked for, the flexibility on kind of altering the work day. That's problematic um, on the city side because of union rules and contract issues that they have. But when we, I guess, reconcile that in our minds, fact, we already pay on the overtime. So if the SRO attends the homecoming game, so that's not an added cost. This is just kind of memorializing what the total operators were or have up to work. So it's not a new cost in that regard. Following up on that, uh, regarding the overtime, I presume that because, because we, we have the, at least some ability, as long as it's not in conflict with the city's needs, to set schedule, we could set schedule in such a way if we so chose to avoid overtime. Is that not correct? With the officers, so having the SRO there, no, we can't flex his hours. We don't have that flexibility. We don't have that flexibility. With regard to uh, paying uh, a portion of the senior officer's salary, I think it's fair to say that the high school is usually assigned more senior officer. So I think we would generally be paying you know, uh, that seniority in any event. When you boil it all down, uh, I realize this is simplistic, but you assume that the officers with District 67 and District 115 will pay the same. Uh, the high school district, our district, will be picking up one sixth of the total pay for our student resource officers. Now we're going to be in a situation where we'll have 
an opportunity to measure it. That I think I think your comments are appropriate. Um, I think now as we move forward, we'll we'll have uh, an opportunity to pay attention to some of those details that we maybe didn't in the past. I can only speak for myself. I'm not insinuating that nobody was paying attention to this deal, um, but I think it's something we need to look at. And then lastly. Um, you know, like in any business scenario, um, those of us that are involved in that on a day-to-day -day basis, if you have to use the contract for the basis of your relationship, you're in trouble, right? So I think the, the, the great relationship that we have with, with our SRO, um, the interactions that he currently has with the kids, I think there's a real deterrent there that helps us in the long run. So the degrees of investment could they be less? Sure they could, but at the end of the day, I think we're getting a pretty good value for, for what we've been asked to support, and, and that was one of the reasons why I had no issue in supporting this, and certainly will in a few moments. Any other discussion? I guess just to clarify, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fully in support of the SRO. Uh, fortunately, most of, the, most of the interactions I've had with the police are very positive. <laughs> Just in case she tells me so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be watching. No, actually, we're about it. Yeah. But yeah. no, we did pull our air punch together uh, last winter. We can do it again this year. I, I just think, uh, and actually, when you say you know, we had the overtime in the past, yeah, we may you know, get charged for overtime, but we've never been asked to step up. But you know, it's actually one third. Not well, it's one third of one and one sixth of both. Right, that we're right. I stopped arguing the benefit of it. Yeah, anyway, yeah, I'm not going to quibble that. No, I'm all in support of uh, the SRO. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Any other comments? Any other questions? Any other comments? Any other questions? 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 Mr. Powers? Aye. Mr. Schreiber? Aye. Mrs. Schreiber? Aye. Mrs. Stolman? Aye. Mrs. Sorensen? Aye. Mr. Markinson? Aye. Mr. Blatt? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, public board members. Uh, it's now time to consider the approval of administrative tuition reimbursement for required endorsements. And so I turn that over to Mr. Simic, I suspect, for an explanation of what it is What's being proposed? Thank you, Mr. Black. Uh, this is uh, an item that uh, we've spent uh, a good deal of time on in, in, in the closed session as it pertains to compensation. Uh, the law recently changed in the state of Illinois uh, from uh, requiring administrators to have what's known as a Type 75, and then uh, it, it moved into um, sort of a no man's land. And in August of this year, there was a change that came out of Springfield that said that administrators had to have uh, a certain uh, endorsement in order to uh, perform functions that they are currently performing in hours and uh, in our in, in, in many schools, many many schools across the state. This is uh, in effect uh, for our district an unfunded mandate from Springfield as. Uh, will, if, if we wish to uh, assist our, uh, our uh, administrators in obtaining the pro appropriate certification, they're going to have to go to uh, a large number of classes, uh, about 30 credit hours worth of classes, which uh, for all of the people that we're talking about, uh, they have uh, young families, they have uh, small children, each of them, and it's also a tremendous amount of additional work some of whom had not planned on doing this work. I appreciate very much the conversations that we've had uh, about this and, and the understanding that the board has had of this. And uh, as I've spoken with uh, some of our board members, uh, I will be uh, speaking with my superintendent colleagues and uh, looking into how many of them would like to join me in a letter uh, to Springfield, articulating some of the concerns that uh, that uh, we see with uh, this, this change in, in the law. Uh, there's no time for us to adjust to it. There's no grace period, if you will. And 
uh, we run into potential compliance issues because of it. Uh, actually, probably likely compliance issues. And so those are some of the, the many things we'll ask for uh, consideration of in Springfield. Uh, as a matter of clarification, since I wasn't here for the discussion uh, last month, uh, it's my understanding that what is being proposed for tonight uh, applies only to those people recently appointed to uh, essentially head of department uh, positions who had caught in flux, so to speak, not knowing any regulations were coming down. It might be that the district nor the individual and are now in a position of obviously not meeting these elevated requirements and looking either at significant out of pocket expenses themselves or, you know, trying to find other ways in which to help fund this rather significant burden. Is that correct? That's a very thoughtful summary, yes. And it is the district's intent to uh, formulate a new policy uh, going forward for future uh, uh, either outside buyers or, or internal promotions into positions that would require this level of certification. Is that correct? Yes, this applies to only three of our current employees. It would not be a policy moving forward. Uh, so the, the recommendation from us would be for the policy committee to consider this and uh, what, what it would look like moving forward. Forward. We do, uh, as as a, as a team, uh, administrative team, we do believe that this issue will fall away. It will not be an issue moving forward, say after three, four, or five years, because everyone applying will know about this and then have the certification, much like they uh, had the, the Type 75 uh, until just recently. Okay, but it's also my understanding this is a much greater burden than the Type 75. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, do I have a motion? Uh, I move that the uh, Lake Forest Community High School District Board of Education approve the administrative tuition reimbursement for the part of the motions. Thank you, Mr. Marks. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Snowland. Is there any further discussion? Yeah, I'd like to just a couple quick things. Um, Superintendent Simic mentioned that this, this is only for three, which is 100% fact-based, but I would just take us back one month. We approved one other member last year or last month, mm -hmm. so it's really a total of four. Um, and I think it's important to state that because what we realized as a board, as much as you try to be uh, equal to everybody, it's important to certainly be fair. And so, as we realized, this burden was was brought on really all four of these individuals that are assuming leadership positions that we couldn't very well you know, manage the finances of one and, and not take under consideration the other three. And so um, that's the purpose for this discussion at this point in time. Um, and then I also agree with Mr. Block around policy. I think it's important um, in whatever the format needs to be, whether it needs to be formal or informal, as we think about what that policy is going to be going forward, because no doubt, I mean, there's gonna be more craziness associated to this and I and I gotta tell you those of you that know me can probably just imagine I have a real problem with this kind of stuff it's almost essentially like the state legislator saying the legislature saying um, you aren't qualified to teach in the state of Illinois unless you have a master's degree well okay I'll go get a master's degree well no sorry it, it's a moment in time without the without the consideration the time and, and effort for, for to earn that degree, you're going to have to not work until you achieve, you achieve that, that certification. And, and there's, there's a lot of craziness in this. Um, and I think it's important for us as a board, whether it's a letter campaign or it's us brainstorming other creative ways to not only um, illustrate our opinion, but defend ourselves, because as I understand the, the, other, the other crazy aspect of this is, if at any time we're audited, we will fail that litmus test of, of having the appropriate certification. And it doesn't matter that our teachers are in process. It's kind of a binary event. Once again, we're either gonna pass or fail if they meet the criteria or not. So, um, so again, I think it's important that, that Understanding the leadership position that these four individuals are taking within our school, we're going to support that from a continuous education standpoint that they meet the qualifications. And then I think it's important for us as a board 
to be prepared to defend and or poke holes in the current rule as it sets today, because I don't know. Look, we can't be the only school in this position, and, and I think that may be part of our strength that we may want to uh, we want to tap into with, with other districts down the road. Thanks. We did, as the Yeah, we're, we just happen to be uh, fortunate enough to not have to eliminate certain things within our budget uh, program. You can well imagine across the state with 75% of the districts in a uh, deficit spending mode, what this would represent for, for those districts. And it comes down to very real choices about whether or not we're going to buy textbooks this year, whether or not we're going to have freshman athletics and so on. That doesn't mean that we have uh, money that we would rather, uh, we, we don't have things that we would rather use these resources for. Uh, we just happen to be more fortunate to have uh, some flexibility within within our budget. But I'm, I'm very bothered by this. I feel actually uh, quite badly for our new administrators who did not know about this. That we, we could not have posted this as a requirement for the work because we didn't know about it, and they have this place upon them, so it could be eight additional courses for them uh, to, to gain this, this certification. And, and that's, I mean, that's, that's, you know, you can't get that done uh, without spending nights and weekends and perhaps summers doing this. And more to the point, so giving a dollar, I'm just realizing that, you know, we're having this discussion with some numbers in front of us, and the public doesn't have the benefit of it. Uh, just for the public's benefit, again, uh, what's, what's being recommended for approval tonight is that we provide up to $15,000 in tuition reimbursement for these four uh, administrators in order to achieve uh, this endorsement, uh, which, depending on the program they take and where they take it, uh, is projected to require uh, from 24 to 36 college credit hours. So at the high end, it is the equivalent of going from a bachelor's degree to a bachelor's degree. And uh, 15,000 was just a compromise. If, if a student were to choose to go to Northwestern University, as a for instance, or University of Chicago, it's going to cost quite considerably more than that if they go to Matt Lewis or uh, you know other educa educational institutions that are available. Thank goodness in the area, it could cost uh, less, but still more than this $15,000. So it, it is more like a copay than it is a you know, complete reimbursement of the cost of the likely to bear. Lastly, I would say, while Mr. Simic is right, you know, we're fortunate for a lot of reasons uh, to be the district we are, uh, financially and otherwise, uh, we're a little unfortunate in the sense that for a variety of reasons, we've had to uh, hire or promote uh, as many uh, department heads as, as we've had to here recently. So we get, we get caught uh, you know, by that situation as well. I can't remember a time when we've you know, either hired or promoted uh, four new department heads here in this short period of time. So, okay, uh, I think it's, uh, is there any further discussion? I, yeah, I, I just wanted to bring up one more point. I think uh, it is fair that we assist with copay, much like the uh, military does, you know, tuition reimbursement. Uh, um, one thing I would ask that as we sign the contract, you know, Whoever does send the uh, contract, I assume it would be yourself. This this would be part of a contract. This is um, these administrators do not uh, have contracts. This is uh, the, the, the working agreement. Yeah, this is a, an authorization for us to reimburse uh, these employees. Uh, with, without this, we would not be able to do that. Okay, and uh, just going forward, the one thing I would like to see though um, is that. You know, we get the value for a uh, dollar, and I hate to see somebody, you know, I'll pay for the uh, certification. I'm going to have them run out the door because Monday line wants what we just paid for. So I think there should be um, you know, something in the works where they agree to stay on for an additional year or two. And then. Um, yeah, we'll follow the LGA contract with the gentleman. Maybe you better step up to the podium.
uh, last month when we approved for the one administrator, um, that was embedded in the language that we shared with you. So it does say, and it will be clearly communicated to these three individuals that will follow the LFEA contract, which talks about uh, the LFEA gets a, a small portion of tuition reimbursement towards their first master's, and it's built in that if they leave within one year, two years, three years, how much they have to pay back to the district. So we're following that same protocol with, with this money. So they will have to, um, again, if they would leave in a year or two years, it, it's, it spells out how much and when they would have to reimburse the district. Okay, that's, that's kind of what I was looking for. Yes, that, that, uh, that exists. That's not what was communicated to us. I'm glad you filled in the blanks. Okay, great. So that's perfect. Okay, great, I think we're ready for roll call. Mr. Schreiber? I. Mrs. Selden? Aye. Mr. Gorman? Aye. Mr. Marcuson? Aye. Mr. Powers? Aye. Mr. Sorensen? Aye. Mr. Black? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, fellow board members. Uh, now, we move on to our next item, which is uh, approval of the Human Resources Report. Mr. Zay? Recommend approving the Human Resources Report as presented. It's fairly light uh, for the public's benefit. Our Little Scouts program and some athletic opportunities uh, over the summer and that sort of thing. Uh, so, uh, do I have a motion? I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education approve the Human Resources Report as presented. Second. Thank you very much. Is there any discussion? Ms. Barrett, roll call, please. Mrs. Sorensen? Aye. Mr. Powers? Aye. Mr. Stoblin? Aye. Mr. Schreiber? Aye. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Mr. Black? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you again, board members, uh, which brings us to the consent agenda. And uh, I think, as uh, you have probably heard in the past, if anyone has an objection to any item on the consent agenda, uh, it can be uh, removed. So do I have a motion for approval of the consent agenda? Well, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any discussion? Yeah, I have one uh, point of clarification for Mr. Alvis, and please pardon my uh, ignorance on this. Uh, we have uh, an approval of a passenger uh, van bid uh, on the agenda. What I'm wondering about is uh, there's a $25,000 limit um, uh, and above that, we need to have bids. My question is about uh, what can be on a consent agenda. Uh, there's no need for something over $25,000 to be an action item. It just needs to be bid, is that correct? Correct. So, well, can you explain, Mr. Simmons, you're stealing my thunder here, I had a conversation with this afternoon. That's all right. Yeah, I, I'm curious, what, because I confess, I don't know. What is the criteria that separates an item being able to be on the consent agenda or uh, you know separately approved and we're being well I'd ask Mike Hernandez on that because that's that's more of a legal question. Okay but we'll take your word for it just go around that everything that's on the consent agenda is is uh, appropriate. But just for the education of the board and the public I would appreciate it if, if you could get back to us uh, some member of the administration as appropriate or Mr. Hernandez if he if he comes and just you know explain that demarcation for the benefit of the board and the community because I confess I don't know what it is. I don't know what any other board members do. Nikki, do you uh, happen to know given your experience? Not explicitly, no. Um, I know that I have seen bid approvals on the consent agenda before, but I have really paid attention to you know whether it's a certain dollar amount limit. So no, I, I, I don't and I'd be interested to learn the same. Really? I'm going to make up the fact and guess that is to, it is to keep us from being here until one in the morning. Yes, thank you, and I'm all in favor. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I can assure you we won't be here that late tonight in any event. But, but uh, you know, somebody made a conscious decision to uh, put, for instance, uh, you know, uh, approval of administrative tuition reimbursement uh, for this required endorsement on, uh, you know, as an individual action item as opposed to on a consent agenda. Zoom, and that was because it couldn't be put on the consent agenda for some reason or other, and vice versa. But maybe I'm wrong. Well, also, that was a, a less routine thing. That was something that the board had discussed over the last uh, 
six weeks or so. Right. Um, it did require a lot of discussion. It required some research, and I, I think that it's it, it wasn't just a routine action, and so we owe ourselves and the public a little bit fuller um, discussion of that. Um, I can only assume that when we do see a bit of the consent agenda, it's because it was routine. Okay, fine. Well, I, I think that's a great idea, Mr. Aldous, if you could develop some further information for from Bradley from LA or elsewhere. Does it let us know what they Does it make sense then to have that item removed? No, because I, you know, and not in my in my view, I'm going on the assumption that it is appropriately there. Uh, I have a, I have a question about uh, the bank agreement as well. Uh, and I think I asked the same question when the, when the agreement was originally put forth to Jenna, I don't know if you remember, but you did a great and thorough job of comparing the bids that we got for our banking relationships, but I guess it's four years ago now. Uh, but it was presented uh, in a way that broke out each particular item, whether it's interest on money on deposit or you know fees for doing something. Nowhere, nowhere was there a bottom line value to the bank or conversely cost to the district uh, estimated you know, between the banks, in other words, you, you didn't project the savings associated, it took the bottom line gross net savings associated with, you know, going one way or another. And can you give us any idea how much this relationship is worth from the bank's perspective? Uh, well, I can't speak for the bank. Um, but it's difficult to do because really it's, it's been, and I think I had another board member that asked me a similar question, it's really about a multitude of things. One, it's about the service that's being provided. Um, two, it's about the compensating balances that are required to cover the services that we're using. So you're talking about that peg balance. How much do we need to keep in the bank to cover you know, the number of deposits that we're going to make, the number of deposits, the direct deposits that we're going to run, the wires that we want to run. And then the third component then is above and beyond that compensating balance, how much interest are we going to earn? Now I will say that the interest rate that we're currently receiving on our liquid funds is much greater I think, than many entities are at this current moment. It's pretty close actually to the two-year treasury rate, which is fairly unusual in this particular market. Um, so it's hard to say you know, exactly what the value is. We don't write a check to the, to the bank for services. You know, it's not how many how many checks went through after they processed, you know, the book rental this year, those type of things. We do get a report every single month that it um, details out the number of services that we use, and then from that chart assigns what that value is to look at whether or not our compensating balance should be higher, are we not keeping enough in there to, co to cover the services that we're using, or in reverse, are we keeping more in our compensating balance than the services that we're receiving? Because if you're doing that, we do not earn interest on the peg balance. So you want to watch where your peg balance is. And what we found is we've really kind of settled in the sweet spot. We're really using the amount of services that are equivalent to the compensating balances that we've been required to hold. And then above and beyond that, of course, we're, we're in investing them at that rate. Okay, but I presume it's not, you know, half a million dollars worth of value to one bank versus another to have our business. But I also presume something greater than zero. Is that a fair statement? Well, I'm assuming they're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart. <laughs> so I'm assuming that they must have some, right, obviously if there is some effort on their end as well. And I think too, I mean, I don't know exactly how their business works, but we are you know, keeping millions of dollars there that they're repurposing and, and using for, for other items and other individuals and, and other businesses as well, while we do so. What okay. if they turn that around and receive I realize it's a complicated it. situation. It's not just a matter of a fixed fee or something that we pay. I just wanted to be providing yeah. insight. And the service component to us is huge. You know, we're very concerned with security and safety of the processes. Um, <clears throat> you know, for instance, if you know, we couldn't upload, if we had to upload our direct deposit file, for instance, for a Friday payable by Monday, because some banks require four or five, that wouldn't work for us. We don't work on, on those type of advanced notices. We're, we're running payables every round. We run 90 payables a year. You know, I need you know probably 30 hours. I mean, I need to be able to have those short windows. So not everyone can meet the demands that we have on the service side. 
Um, so when we did that analysis four years ago, that was, that was a big piece. What are those must-have service pieces? And I have to say, they've really held up their end of the bargain. They've really done a nice job servicing our account uh, over the last four years. Again, for the benefit of those who don't have the same documentation in front of them that we do, uh, we negotiated this agreement three and a half years or something ago uh, with Lake Park Bank and Trust. And, and there was a, a, a real provision for an additional two years at the time, I guess, that we could take advantage of. Asking now to do that, we're already a year into that period, so effectively it's probably a year late for us. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further discussions on the consent agenda? I was going to ask a couple of questions, but you pretty much uh, answered you know, how, you know, how close we were running to compensating balances. So I know we need quite, quite a bit there. And, um, I think in the next year, though, uh, in the interest of disclosure, I and the whole Lake Forest Bank and Harris, and I like them all. But I, I think, you know, rather than going to 25 institutions, going to one of those two, I'd like to see after it expires in uh, like December 15th, that uh, we do run the analysis again to make sure uh, we're still getting the, you know, the best deal we can get. We, it is a large balance. If I may point out, I was the other board member who asked the questions, and I received about a term paper length reply, which was very <laughs> thorough, and I appreciated it. And I will share with my fellow board members. Thank, Thank you. you. I, it might be worth pointing out for anyone who might happen to be watching this meeting and wonder what in the world we're talking about um, about the consent agenda. Um, even though there, these are items that are grouped on the agenda for tonight's meeting to be voted on all at one time, the board actually does receive a packet several. Definitely, it's worth doing. I, I would encourage it. And thank 